Good afternoon, everyone. I think that I may have been muted while I said it. It was my pleasure to wish you good morning this morning, and now my pleasure to wish you good afternoon. As I introduce our next speaker, Terry Locke, who is the Director of Education at the Arkansas Municipal League and has multi-decades of experience as an attorney, where you certainly need to know about civility and how to work with people, as well as many years as a civility trainer and mindfulness coach. Carrie, thank you so much for joining us. I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Robert. I really appreciate that introduction and the invitation to be here with all of you today to talk about this most important subject in our country, in our state, and in our cities and our towns right now. I also want to thank, before I begin, uh, Drake University, the Iowa League of Cities, and also NLC for their partnership in producing, again, this very important talk today. So I will pull my slides up here and begin by giving you the headline uh, with which we're going to talk today. Uh, why we do what we do. The goal for all of us as public servants and as um, elected officials and also city employees is to deliver on our promises. Our promises to provide city services, our promises to uphold our commitment to inform the public about what we're doing, to guarantee engagement and openness in our discourse with one another. We also want to do all of this, as is underscored by the summit today, with an attitude of civility and with a human touch. For our mission is to serve the public. It is always the mission as public servants to be there for the public, to meet their needs. And it's very easy to forget that that is why we do what we do. It is very normal. And I want to normalize the fact that we all have our moments. It is easy to become desensitized in our day-to-day -day work. And it is easy to forget that we are dealing with actual human beings, human beings that deserve the same amount of respect and empathy and understanding that we ourselves wish to be treated with. They, the public, are indeed our why. So how do we get there? How do we go from the day-to-day the chaos, the manic nature of, of how it is to run a city or a town. We all know that, as I've already noted, that we all have our moments, the times at which we lose our patience, the times at which we engage in discourse that is less than civil. But we can get there. It can be done. It's not easy. But we can work together and we can start with ourselves to create a more open and civilized discourse. As has been noted by most of the speakers this morning, uh, we create so much better short-term and long-term outcomes in our discourse when we treat each other and the public with compassion and with empathy. And so how do we get there? How do we actually deliver on these promises to deliver exceptional public service in government? Well, I intimated it a minute ago that it must start individually with ourselves. All of you, I am sure, have heard the Gandhi quote that in order for us to change the world, we must first change ourselves. None of us have control over the behavior of anyone else. The only person's behavior that we can control is ourselves. And so by using some of the tools and strategies below that we're going to talk about more in depth on, we can be more mindfully aware 
Uh, Scott actually referenced most of these things in his talk first thing this morning. We have to be present. We have to actually be in the present moment to engage with what is actually happening in order for us to be able to respond in an appropriate way to what is actually happening in front of us. We also want to use open communication. This includes active listening, somewhat, sometimes called reflective listening, and also cultivating and using emotional intelligence. These things can engender respect, respect and understanding for other people. And when we do these things, when we practice mindfulness, when we openly communicate, when we use our emotional intelligence, what happens is, is we can more easily connect with our why. We can remember why it is we are doing what we do, we are doing, which can be very instructive for us, invig reinvigorating for us and help us to serve the public in the way that we promised we would do when we were elected. And so to talk about the first tool or strategy that we might use, the word mindfulness is a word that I'm sure most of you have heard at this point in 2023. It is really part of the lexicon now uh, in our country. For those of you who don't know what mindfulness is, it is really just the cultivation of present moment awareness. Mindfulness is the practice of engaging in the present moment with an attitude of openness, of kindness, and of acceptance for what we find. The reasons for which we practice mindfulness are many. But one of the most important is that what happens is we can disconnect from the narrative that is always playing in our minds. It's what some neuroscientists call the story of me. It is the narrative that most of us have on an ongoing basis playing in the back of our mind. It disconnects us with the present moment and interrupts our ability to engage with absolute reality. It can be done in multiple ways. In fact, I like to say that it can be done in thousands of different ways. Any activity that you are doing in which your body and your mind are aligned with each other, then you are practicing mindfulness. If you like to garden, if you like to listen to music or to make art, all of those activities are mindfulness activities. You commonly hear about mindfulness activities as ones that include sitting and paying attention to your breath, paying attention to a sound or something that is tangible. And so what we're going to do together is a practice this morning, one that was developed at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center, and it is a way to very quickly move you from a state of acute distress to a state of calm. This practice is called STOP, and it's an acronym for stop what you're doing, take three mindful breaths, Observe your body, your mind, and your environment before proceeding. And so I'm going to invite you to do this practice with me today. I'm going to set a timer because it is easy for me to lose track of time when I do these practices. This is going to be about a five minute practice. If you are in a space in which you can sit down, I would invite you to sit if you're not already sitting. And crossing your legs, putting both feet on the floor. That practice alone is a practice of mindfulness. It's what some teachers call embodiment. It is a way to send the message to your mind that your body is in the same place where your mind is. 
inviting you to close your eyes if that's comfortable for you. And if it's not, then inviting you to just soften your gaze at a spot in front of you. And begin by taking notice that we have stopped looking at our screens, stopped the activity of learning for the moment. And are taking a moment to shift our attention. Beginning by taking three mindful breaths. And all that means is paying attention all the way through the inhale and the exhale three times. And then inviting you to take a moment to observe the state of your mind right now. Doing this with that attitude of openness and acceptance for whatever you find there. Maybe noticing a lot of thoughts passing through. Noticing the state of your mood today. Again, like you're a third party observer. And now inviting you to shift your attention to your body. Noticing what's there. And again, without trying to change anything, just accepting and noticing. perhaps areas of ease or of dis-ease. And then finally, inviting you to observe your environment. Noticing the sounds around you. Perhaps the air and how it feels. Maybe the chair upon which you sit. And again, just with an attitude of openness, of acceptance. Without a desire to change what you find. Then inviting you to allow that observation to fade. Coming back into touch with your body as your feet are firmly on the floor. Noting and acknowledging to yourself this act that you have done for yourself. And then whenever you're ready, allowing your eyes to open and proceed. <clears throat> okay.
for those of you whom have not ever done a practice like that, I would be curious um, for you to check in with yourself as to how that made you feel. It's possible that you feel more relaxed and more centered at this point. It's also possible that you do not. The focus of these practices work even if we don't cognitively feel like they work. The science behind them is that what happens is the stress circuitry of your brain by virtue of that practice calmed and you actually moved into the area of the prefrontal cortex. That's the area from which you have logical control, emotional control, and can engage in a more civil discourse because you are allowing yourself to pause, to notice, and to choose a different path. And so for those of you who would like to practice that on your own, you can do it in a moment of acute distress. You don't have to close your eyes. I do it often in meetings that are tense, that are um, ones in which there are perhaps disagreements and things happening. I will drop into that practice without anyone around me even knowing that I'm doing it. And it allows me to move more into a state of calm so that I can better control and regulate my own behavior. And so again, just to review those steps, it's an acronym called STOP. Stop what you're doing, take three mindful breaths, observe your body, your mind, and your environment before proceeding. So now we'll move into a few of the other benefits of a mindfulness practice. What we have talked about mostly is the emotional and the behavioral quadrants that you see on the right side of your screen the ability to be more resilient to stressful situations, to increase our empathy and our compassion for those with whom we are dealing, to be able to be less reactive when provoked or triggered, which happens to all of us all the time, to help us be more ethical and more persistent in following our values and the reasons for which we are doing what we do, and it helps us to have more patience with those with whom we're dealing. And I think it's important for us to note as well at this point that these benefits are not just inuring to you as the individual, but the impact that these actions have on the other people around you and the greater public for whom you serve cannot be understated. And so next moving into the topic of open communication, which is an integral strategy in being able to engage in a more civil discourse. This quote by Liz Papadopoulos, uh, she says in her podcast, Professionally Speaking, that effective communication requires more than an exchange of information. When done right, communication fosters understanding, it strengthens relationships, improves teamwork and builds trust. Open communication is really built on both verbal and nonverbal communication. 95% of communication is actually nonverbal. And while our words have incredible power, it is also so important for us to monitor our facial expressions, what kind of eye contact we're giving to the person with whom we're talking, the ability to nod and to show the person that you're dealing with that you hear them, perhaps using brief affirmations like, I hear you, I know, I understand what you're saying, can be incredibly powerful in engendering trust, in engendering openness in the engagement with the other person. Active listening is also a skill that is so important in being able to increase trust. Active listening is really the act of paying attention to what the person is saying to you without rehearsing what your response is going to be, without rehearsing what you're going to say next, 
but actually listening to what they have to say so that it can be more instructive to you as to how you want to respond. It's also important to reflect back to the listener what it is you heard, to reflect back by asking questions, to make sure you understand what they said, and then to repeat back to them what they said so that you can both be clear as to what was communicated. When we can engage in these things, it can shift the attitude and the engagement of the entire process. And without it, there is increased distrust, as we have talked about this morning, increased conflict, and increased disruption in the public discourse. We also want to engage with respect. Respect is something that we have talked about all morning. Um, Secretary Vilsack talked about respect this morning. Respect cannot be understated. The importance of it is paramount. And he mentioned the golden rule. It's actually something that I always mention when talking about civility. Respect is a two-way street. We have to give respect in order to receive respect. And so practicing the golden rule of treating others with respect so that you will also receive respect in response. It's kind of like the metaphor of a fire truck. Uh, when your local fire station is called to go to a fire, thankfully that fire truck does not take fire to put out that fire, but actually takes water to put out that fire. And so we have to respond in the most effective way to a situation in order for it to calm. And respect is something that is undergirded in the way that we speak, not just the words that we're using, but the tone in which we speak to others, the volume of our voice, the emotion that we use in our voice. The science shows us that nervous systems attune to other nervous systems. And so when we as leaders can engender respect in our communication, it actually invites at a cellular level the people that we are around to engage in the same way in response to us. We also want to cultivate and practice greater emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is really just the awareness of your own emotions and the ability to attune to the emotions of other people. It includes being able to be mindful of your own insecurities and your own weak spots. So being aware of what triggers you, what can set you off so that you can be more responsive to your own emotions, perhaps using that stop method that we learned earlier so that you can more easily control your emotions and respond in a way that is going to invite a more civil response. It's also being able to read the room to know what's needed in the moment. Sometimes it's effective to respond to an angry citizen. Sometimes it's not effective to respond. And emotional intelligence is one of the ways in which we can receive that information, uh, receive that instruction, if you will, as to how best to adjust to the needs of the situation. It's really being able to put yourself in the shoes of another person, to be able to practice empathy, to be able to practice kindness and compassion in how you are responding, how you are adjusting, and how you are dealing with the person with whom you're speaking. And finally, Understanding. Understanding is 
a soft skill like most of the skills that we have already discussed. And Forbes has actually just come out with a study that notes that soft skills for leaders are actually far more important than hard skills, than the skills of technical uh, problem solving of whatever it is that your degree is in. But the ability to understand and to listen to another person is a hallmark of a great leader and underscores a civil discourse. It's being able to consider another viewpoint without villainizing it or demonizing it. It is um, actually the opposite of the way our country is headed, as we have learned all morning. It is moving in a different way. It is being able to agree to disagree. Uh, one of the things that I often talk about uh, when I'm working with newer leaders or with older leaders is treating what you're doing as business. It's the business of public service. And just like with your career that you might have had before public service, it was so important for you to be able to leave that at the end of the day and leave it behind and be able to, with a person with whom you disagreed at work, to be able to go out together, enjoy some music together, and enjoy a meal together. It's being able to agree to disagree without thinking that the other person is wrong. Because each of us is valid in our own viewpoints. While we might disagree with someone else's viewpoint, everyone has the right to their own point of view. One of the metaphors that I like to use at this point is the adage of what we resist persists. When we continue to villainize or to demonize the other side, what happens is, is that it grows. If you think about two people standing opposite one another and physically pushing against each other's hands, the more one person pushes, the harder the other person pushes. And so it creates a stalemate. But when one of you can be understanding and actually shift the, the resistance, shift the pressure against, then things can be more calm, leading to the ability to communicate, to try to understand and the other person's point of view, no matter what. And so when we practice all of these skills, when we use the tools and the strategies that we discussed today, including mindful awareness, emotional intelligence, and open communication, we can indeed reach a more civil discourse with one another. It can help us remember why it is we do what we do, can help connect us more fully with our purpose so that we can deliver the kind of exceptional public service that all of us signed up for when we got here.